Hey, what's going on, y'all? It's the Funnel Doctor. Hope everyone is having an amazing morning. Uh, we got a very special live coming. Uh, I haven't been live in for like a few weeks. Uh, we've got a very uh, special esteemed guest. Will be a great conversation. Uh, do me a favor when you jump on, uh, type your name, your business name, and make sure you share this out. Tag some people that need to be here. Post this on your story. Put it in someone's DM. Again, we're gonna have a very very special conversation uh, from my entrepreneurs. Uh, my six figure, seven figure, eight figure earners. And if you want to learn how to get to seven figures, multiple seven figures, uh, you in the right. Yolanda, Terrence, my guy, what's going on? Um, I'm trying to accept the request. Hey, oh. hey. Hey, how you doing? I'm good. Let me get my little camera together. I'm good. All right. Great. How are you? I'm good. Just, you know, staying busy, working and doing what I, doing what I do, you know. What we do. Right. Yes. <laughs> what we do. Uh-huh. How's everything going with you? Things are good. Uh, had a couple meetings already today, but it's good. I'm excited for us to chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. So definitely just appreciate you for coming on. I know you're very busy. You probably have one of the busiest schedules of all the people that I know. I know a lot of people. <laughs> so you do. That, you yeah, do. I do. So that's saying a lot. So I know you're busy. So I definitely just appreciate you coming on and having this conversation. I want to say that first and foremost. Of course. Of course. I'm just grateful for the opportunity. I respect the work that you do. Respect the community that you're building. So I'm just grateful to be a part of it. So thank you for having me. Definitely. So I know you're going to drop some gems. So we'll get to all that stuff, of course. But for those that, you know, are not familiar with you, if they've been hiding under a rock somewhere, um, of course, you know, like to get an introduction from you, where you're from, we know what you do, how did you get to that point? Of course, you're a former educator, but uh, definitely want to know, you know, just your background. Yeah, so I center my story around the places that I call home. So uh, first and foremost, my story starts actually in the state of Mississippi where my mother was born and raised. I did not have the gift or privilege of growing up in Mississippi, but that's to me important uh, to understand my story because that's actually where I go for holidays. That's where all my family is. And so um, that is, is home number one is the state of Mississippi. The second place I call home is Columbus, Ohio. So I grew up in the Buckeye State. I'm a very, very proud Buckeye. I graduated from the Ohio State University. So I don't fool with Michigan, just to be <laughs> real clear. Uh, and that's where I grew up. That's where I went to undergrad. Uh, the third place I call home is Charlotte, North Carolina. So after undergrad, I moved to Charlotte, North Carolina to become a teacher. I was a high school math teacher. So if you heard that, you're like, oh, she's smart. You would be correct. I am very smart. Uh, I was a high school math teacher, taught geometry, taught algebra, algebra two, lots of cool subjects. And then I went on to become a school leader. So I was an assistant principal, was a middle school principal. Uh, if you know anything about middle schoolers, you know it's a lot. They're very dramatic, uh, which is why I love them so much because, you know, they keep you on your toes. And then I moved to Cambridge, Massachusetts. I do not call Cambridge, Massachusetts home, but it's in the story. Um, moved to Cambridge, Massachusetts to get my doctorate at Harvard Graduate School of Education. So was there for three years. And now the third and final place that I, or fourth and final place that I call home is DC. So I live in DC. I've been here about a year and a half uh, in the chocolate city with my people, <laughs> running my business full time. So I've had my business for six years, EJT Education Group, started when I was a principal, uh, coaching principals, working with school districts, and then grew my business over the past six years. Uh, we've grown a business development arm where we help black educators grow six and seven figure education consulting businesses. Um, and I do that full time, have an amazing team. I see one of my team members is in the chat. Uh, hey girl. Um, and I uh, have a team of five, four of them are employees. We're a million dollar company. Um, and so it's been a beautiful journey because I started as a teacher being paid $33,000 a year. And now I'm a full-time entrepreneur running a million dollar business. And cool. so I'm excited for the conversation. I'm excited to share anything that would be helpful for folks. Mm, come through talking heavy. <laughs> like you know, you really just stay in fact. You asked for right. facts. So I was right. Like, right. <laughs> right. Like seriously, did y'all catch like how she just came through talking heavy? You know, first and foremost, we have to definitely congratulate you from getting a PhD from Harvard. Like seriously, that is amazing. I don't know how many black women 
uh, have PhDs from Harvard, but I'm sure it's probably not that many. So definitely just want to congratulate you on that. Thank you. Thank you. 2% of, of, uh, of black folks have terminal degrees, meaning PhDs. And so I have to remind myself that um, it's, it's something worth holding sacred and acknowledging. So I appreciate that. Yeah, of course. That's, that's amazing. Uh, and of course, building a multi-million dollar company, of course, which we'll talk about. But I do want to, I do have some uh, questions. I'm curious, like, what was that experience, just even for myself personally, what was that experience like getting, you know, your doctor from Harvard? You know, it's interesting because folks, so tell me, tell me if this is the spirit behind your question. Because most of the folk, most of the time when folks ask me that question, they're like, what was it like being black at Harvard? Like sometimes like that, usually that's like the I question to just say it out that, right, that they but, ask. You know. <laughs> and so if that's a question, happy to answer the question. I want to make sure I'm answering the right question. Um, and, you know, my perspective is really unique because, A, I was a doctoral student, which is very different than going there for undergrad. Right, right, right. right. It's, it's real different because um, undergrad is like Hunger Games, honestly. Like that was my observation of it. It's, it's a different world. Uh, I was also in the School of Education. And so, like, if you think of any other, you know, university or institution that has different schools on their campus, I'm sure Temple is set up similarly. There's the School of Business, there's the School of Fine Arts, whatever. So the School of Education is probably the most welcoming, like, like chill, dope place in comparison to any other campus, because you have the Kennedy School, which is for policy. So those are a lot, a lot of politicians, a lot of entrepreneurs. You got the B school, the business school, which is like a whole nother beast, right? Yeah, right you got right. the law school, the school of public health. So like every school has their own personality and identity. And so when you think about the school of education, like these are everybody who's teachers, principals, like they're people who they, they lead from their heart, they lead from their values, they lead from a spirit of service. And so I think that already just sets up a different vibe. And then my program, we were a cohort. So it was 25 of us. And actually more than half of my cohort was black. So like my experience was very different. Um, me and my cohort, I, I ride and die for the 24 people in my cohort. Um, and so I say that to say is, you know, I had a, a little bubble where I belonged, where I felt affirmed, where I didn't feel out of place. Like, and if anything, you know, you have these perceptions of what spaces of privilege look like, feel like when I got there, I was like, oh, I, most of y'all ain't smart. Like, like <laughs> oh, like I, I belong here and I belong everywhere, right? And so that's why for me, it's really important to talk about the experience at Harvard because I think there's so many connotations and, and assumptions around what it's like and whether or not I'm welcome or belong. It's like, actually, when you get there, you realize mm. you're the smartest person in the room. Mm. <laughs> and like, and the experience of like, growing up and I have a lot of money, like working in a school, being a principal for black and brown kids, like it actually positions me with a really unique perspective and experience that's necessary. And I push people's thinking in the room, right? Um, so, so yeah, it was a great experience. Uh, lots of complexities there, but like I would not change it for the world and met some amazing people there too. Mm, I love that. And that's very interesting. And I love how you broke down the perspective of like, because there are different parts of the university. Like you say, there's the B school, there's the right. law school, there's undergrad, you know, there's the school of education. So a lot of people don't think about that because they think like, oh, you went to Harvard and you're black. Like, what was that like? You know what I mean? But it's really funny. Um, so that was going to lead to my next question was, did you always want to get education? Um, I feel like a lot of teachers, they kind of always like my sister's a teacher, actually. Um, and she's actually working uh, with me over the summer and stuff. I told her about you. I told her about your program. I told her she needs to go to your event in September. Hopefully she goes. Hopefully she sees us live and I'll push her again. But, I was about to say, Ryan, we need to do some team building, <laughs> more team building, because I did not know that. Yes. I did not know that. And actually, the answer I'm getting ready to tell you, I don't think he, I, we haven't talked about either. So it might be a surprise to you. But the answer to your question, first off, like, hey, to your sister, like, tell us what's up and like, hit me up, sis. Um, and the answer is absolutely no. Ooh. So actually, um, fun fact, I was actually a textiles and clothing major in college. And so the vision for my life is that I, at that time, was that I was going to be a fashion merchandiser or buyer for a large retail company. And so for those of y'all that aren't familiar with that, with the retail fashion world, uh, for every large 
major retailer, there's a position called a merchandiser or a buyer that basically is kind of the middleman between, so for example, Macy's, there's a buyer that is working with different brands and given what they're analyzing in the market, the current trends, they go out and work with different brands to actually buy the, the clothes, the lines or whatever in the stores based off of market trends. Mm. Um, so it's like the, it was for me like the perfect mix of like, I love fashion and the creativity, but also like I was a, a you know, a, a very analytical brain. I'm like, I'm looking at all these numbers to be able to predict patterns and trends in the fashion market and then buy on behalf of a large uh, retailer. So actually in college, I had an internship all throughout college with L Brands, which is based in Columbus, Ohio. So at that time, they owned Victoria's Secret, Express, Limited, Bath and Body Works, Henry Bindle. Wow. So my goal was actually to work for them full time after I graduated. Um, but I graduated in 2008. And if anybody knows about the context in 2008, the economy was crashing and they were could not offer a job. So that's actually what caused me to pivot into education. Wow. Yeah, I don't think I knew that. Yeah, um, we ain't talking about that. We, <laughs> we ain't talking about, about that. that. Uh, wait, Latrice said I ain't want to miss her comment. Most of y'all ain't smart. Definitely the experience of Black girls in Ivy Leagues. <laughs> Shout out to um, Latrice, who's one of my coaches, who's also a Harvard grad. So she, she knows about that Black girl Ivy League life. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, but yeah, I definitely didn't know that because, like I said, I see a lot of people that are educators, like, oh, I always wanted to be an educator. Ever since I was little, I always wanted to be a teacher. It was my dream job and stuff like that. Uh, so I definitely was just curious about that. Uh, so now I definitely do want to shift and talk about business. Since, you know, I know we don't have that much time. You know, so how did you stumble into entrepreneurship? Was it like, hey, I'm working this, you know, in education. I'm seeing the difficulties in it. Like, I want to be my own boss. I want to start my own company. I feel like I can do more. Um, was it, you know, always, I know you said, you originally just wanted to work for that company in 2008. Was it because of market trends? Like, what made you want to be crazy and become an entrepreneur right. and start your own company? Of course, hire people and build a multi million dollar company. Yeah. So, that's a great question. So, uh, I have two answers to that question. Um, the first answer is you know, I, I think it's interesting when you talk to a lot of entrepreneurs, or at least it's been my experience, is that for most entrepreneurs, their story of origin of how they started their business usually came out of some type of disruption like they lost their job or they like something happened in their personal life and they're like i need to start making more money or like they're just so fed up with their boss like some type of it's, it's usually not, not like oh i wake up and i want to start right, 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 right. <laughs> like, it is like you experience some type of personal spiritual or mental disruption that is telling you i can no longer continue to do the same thing i have to do something different and you decide to consider this idea of creating something right and so for me that disruption actually happened when I was a principal where someone came to my school from the district office and told me a proposal was going to the school board the next week to add 300 kids to my school the following year. And we already had a thousand kids. So I was like, so we about to have 1300 kids and I'm not getting any additional counselors. I'm not getting any social emotional support. About 80 to 90% of our students qualified for free and reduced lunch, which means we had a concentration of poverty in my school. And anybody who's grown up in the hood or has grown up in poverty knows you need more supports. <laughs> like right, we, need, we need counselors, we need more resources because we're starting five steps behind and that's not what the district was gonna give me. And not to mention my pay was gonna stay the same. So that was a, 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 my disruption that caused me to think, what would it look like to create? Mm. And I created my business from that with no idea that it was gonna grow into a million dollar business. I was just like, I'm not gonna be able to stay at my job because I don't agree with this. And by me staying is agreeing. Um, so that was like the first C, but it was interesting because even when I made that decision, I didn't see myself as an entrepreneur. Mm. It wasn't until the next year when I started my doctoral program, I was actually taking a, a class um, around entrepreneurship. That was a required class that we had to take. And I learned the concept of entrepreneurship. So there's entrepreneurship, which is means you are embodying the spirit of creating. You're just creating within an existing organization versus entrepreneurship is you are creating your own organization. 
And that's when I realized, I was like, wait a minute, I've always been an entrepreneur as a teacher, as a principal, I've always been creating, it's just been someone else's organization. So I already have the existing skills, I'm just now doing it for myself. So that was kind of my origin story that got me started in the business. Mm, I love it. So yeah, that is interesting because you know I have a similar story. Like I worked in corporate, I worked in finance, very corporate environment. I'm not like a super corporate person. I <laughs> thought... just, that, that's why I'm like I'm trying to envision this, and I'm like I need a picture. Right. Like, <laughs> I got some pictures. I got. Picture. <laughs> I got some pictures. No beard, suited and booted, tattoos covered. You know, like I can play the game to an extent. Um, and for me, like when I first got my corporate job. I thought I was set. Yeah. I was like, I'm good. I'm going to work here for 40 years. I'm going to get my 401k. I'm going to retire. I'm going to keep, you know, getting my raises annually and stuff like that. But it was a disruption. I really saw how corporate politics mm. worked. You know, I saw people coming in that graduated years after me becoming my boss after six months. And I'm right. like, oh, like, what's going on? I'm like, you know what I mean? And I realized right. in corporate, like, it's not about who can do the job the best. You know what I mean? It's about who can play the political game the best. Right. And for me, like, I'm not good at that game. I don't want to play politics. I already was a disadvantage anyway, me being one of the few black people there. Right. So I just didn't want to play that game. So I literally dove head first into entrepreneurship at like 28. I already been an entrepreneur now for like eight years. So <clears> at 28, I didn't know what I was doing. I was very naive. It was a lot of struggle, a lot of challenges and stuff like that. But it's definitely been one of the best decisions that I've ever made in my life. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I definitely have a similar story. So my question now is really about scaling the seven figures, because we know only a very small percentage of companies in general get the seven figures, let alone black owned companies. Right. So if you could just share maybe three tips or strategies and you always give nuggets and gems in your stories and in your content. But for someone that's like, Maybe they're at six figures or multiple six, and how do I get to seven? Or they may just be starting out, but they still want to get to that seven figure or beyond threshold. What are some tips and strategies that helped you get to seven figures relatively quickly, giving most people don't even get there at all? Yeah, that's a great question. All right, so three tips to transition to seven figures. So uh, the first thought that comes to my mind is, like, you have to embody seven figures before it's in your bank account, mm -hmm. right? And so- like from a mindset standpoint, from a belief, from an action standpoint, and I'm actually taught this last night because I'm, I'm in the middle of a five day business school and taught the psychology of a millionaire, right? Like there is a hidden curriculum that, that millionaires follow in terms of their beliefs, in terms of their actions, in terms of how they make decisions. And so part of that is like, you have to understand that. And a part of understanding that is like getting proximate to to seven figure business owners, to paying for access to getting in the room. And I think part of this, and I think the nuance, and I'll speak from the, the perspective of me being a black woman, part of this is understanding where I come from, right? Because I think seven figures feels hard when you are disconnected from who you are and where you come from, right? And so when I think about my, my ancestry, my lineage, people who've come before me, where it's like, my mama survived growing up in a small rural town of 2,000 people in rural Mississippi, was a valedictorian. And what many people don't know is I'm not the first in my family to have a, a doctorate. Wow. My mama got a doctorate. Oh, I right? didn't know that. And actually, my daddy got a doctorate. Oh, and so, okay. like, to, to, to be so connected of not just what my mom has done, what my dad has done, but it's like there were people who survived where actually making money is easy. <laughs> like in comparison to, to the ways in which my grandmother, who does not have a high school education, who is 87 years old, still living in Lexington, Mississippi, and retired from working at Piggly Wiggly and raised seven children, Ooh. like she survived to where, how dare I not wow. go after this, right? Ooh. And so like, if she could survive, actually making money is easy in comparison to what those before me have done in order for me to be positioned to do this, right? And so like, that's the first thing is like, from a mindset standpoint and personally for me, what keeps me grounded is A, my faith and also B, my history, right? Like I'm not the first to do this. I won't be the last to do this. And, and recognizing the shoulders of the folks that I stand on where it's like, 
actually making us creating a seven figure business in comparison to where I come from is light work, Whoa. right? So that's thing number one. Thing number two is, and, and mindset's gonna be a through line, but thing number two is like, you gotta have a team, period, yeah, point right. blank. <laughs> like, like you have to have a team. And to take it even deeper, when I say team, you are gonna have to make the transition to full-time employees. Mm. So part of the way that, you know, I talk about the difference between a contractor and employee, and I'm not saying you should not have contractors, there's a time and place for contractors, but there is a core part of your team that you are going to have to stabilize where that core part of your team is going to have to be solely dedicated to your business. And the language that I use that I think most of us, all of us can understand is when you have a contractor, you are the side chick. You decide, that's it. Right. Yeah. Like you are not the main, right. they have multiple clients and you got to get in line and when it's your time, it's your time. Right. And so like, that is the unintended consequence of a contractor, which in some areas of your business, you can afford to have a side chick relationship with the contractor. But in other areas of your business, i.e. client delivery, I can't be as, I can't have no side chick. I need a main, right, 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 <laughs> like right, right. I need you to fully, <laughs> A hundred a hundred percent dedicated to my business because I cannot afford to get in the queue when it comes to client delivery. So that's that would be piece number two is you're going to have to build a team more specifically. You're going to have to hire employees. And then the third and final thing that I, I think we don't talk enough about is you are going to have to build solid operations because I cannot tell you and even granted. I'm coming from being a principal of a school of a thousand middle school kids. So the operations in my business, I'm not saying they're easy, but it's, it's I have the experience of like, yeah, I yeah. have a, I, I am, I have a bias towards systems because we could not dismiss kids without a system. <laughs> we cannot dismiss a thousand kids without having a system. We couldn't do lunch without a system. Right, right? Right, right. So like I have a bias towards that. But I think what so many people underestimate about systems, and when I say systems, there's an operational piece of it. There's also financial management systems. There are a strategic planning system. So there's lots of different buckets in terms of systems. But people, you cannot wing it in your business. Mm. You can wing it to six figures. You, if, if, you, if you real kind of hustle with it, you could wing it to multiple six figures. You cannot wing it to seven. Mm. And the 0.05% that might be able to wing it to seven, I guarantee you they stressed out. Right. They stressed. So you have got to have systems in order to scale to seven figures, because if not, you're going to have a broken business and then you're going to be stuck at seven and it's not, it's not sustainable. Mm. I love that. <laughs> Listen, I told y'all, I knew she was going to drop some gems. Uh, if you're getting value out of that, please drop something in the chat, put an emoji a fire, a jam, or something like that. Uh, thank you, Latrice, so much for summing those up. Uh, people putting those uh, bullseye in the chat. I just want to check the chat. Yes, listen, I agree with that 100%. I'm still on my journey there. We're halfway there. We're trying to get to the other half. And I know we talked a little bit about this in Atlanta, really of that client fulfillment side of, like, getting real employees and, you know, right. not outsourcing right. and stuff like that. So listen, I received those gems as well, along with everyone else. Uh, so in the last few minutes that we got, of course, I want you to talk about what you have going on, uh, your current five-day, uh, I was about to say challenge, but I know it's business school, you call it. Um, so of course, how can people, you know, sign up for that if they want to? And if anybody has any quick questions, uh, feel free to drop it down. Maybe Dr. Eric can share them, uh, uh, answer them briefly. Yeah, so uh, I mean, my mission is to set more black educators free, right? Like that's my, like at the end of the day, like that is like the, the meat and potatoes of the work that I do, the work that we do on our team. And I believe you cannot have a freedom conversation without talking about money. Uh, because a part of, of, you know, recognizing, I think the, the, the complexities of our relationship with money is to recognize that we live in a country that has told, historically told Black people that if you get money, you will experience harm, you will experience violence, you will be pushed to the margins, like you will be unsafe if you right, get money, right, right, right? Right, right, right? And so there's a lot of, of, of healing work that we need to anticipate and that we need to do 
But I believe that that experience and that narrative of how money is seen as taboo is actually the way oppression works, right? Because you can't grow something that you're not willing to talk about. And so that is a part of the work that we do is really just help, help set Black educators free. And, by, and when I say set free, we need to help you make more money. Now, what you choose to do with your money is your choice, but we're going to help you get financially free, free. And the beautiful thing about it is you already have existing gifts and talents that you are leveraging, whether you are a classroom teacher, whether you're a principal, whether you're a district administrator, a social worker, a counselor, you already have million dollar gifts. Mm. So what does it mean to package those million dollar gifts into a million dollar business? And that's what we help you to do such that you can get free because the beautiful thing about this and my belief that we operate from is when black educators get free, they set other people free too. Mm. And I'm an example of that, right? Like I'm free and now I'm out here giving out the cheat code. It's what happens when good people get more money, we do more good things. So what is currently present for us is I'm in the middle of a five day business school, our seven figured business school where I'm teaching for five days content around how to grow with your seven figure business. I'm teaching our blueprint. So yesterday we broke down the psychology of a millionaire. Today we're talking about million dollar problem. Tomorrow I'm teaching profitable offers. The day after tomorrow we're talking about million dollar sales that aren't salesy. And then day five, I'm going to help you map your million dollar networks. That way by the end of the day, you got, or by the end of the five days, you have all the puzzle pieces to start pitching. Because my goal is for people to make money, point blank, period. Um, so that's what we're in the middle of. If you're interested in joining us, I would love to have you. I would welcome you. All you have to do is just click the link in my bio to sign up. It's completely free. We have a VIP option, which you can learn more about once you register. Um, but it's completely free to join us. Okay. So, yeah, make sure you all sign up. Uh, take the link in her bio. Also, if you're not following Dr. Erica or myself, go to the top drop down. You don't have to leave the live yet. Go to the top drop down and just follow us. Uh, and then once you're on her page, she has a link there to sign up. Uh, as soon as you sign up, you'll get your reminders and everything like that. Uh, <laughs> make sure you're there. Uh, you're getting text alerts and everything. I'll let you know how I'm funnel hacking, so I love all the <laughs> I love everything about it. I'm in the group, too. And I definitely watched last night as well. You was dropping some gems, talking about profit first and all that yeah. stuff as well. I'm like, okay, like, you definitely, like, you, like, honestly, you could charge a lot of money just for the stuff you're doing for free. I know you have your VIP option as well, but I'm like, you're giving a lot of gems. Like, this could be, like, a $1,000 training just in itself, honestly. Well, and I think that's, I think that's the, the beauty of, of when your business coach was a former teacher, right? Right, exactly, right. Right, 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 right. <laughs> like, like literally my entire career is, has focused on how to develop an effective learning experience. And so uh, people are like so blown away by the fact that like I'm consistently giving value, which part of that is the content, but the other part of this is the experience. And that's one of my unique gifts is because it's like for over 15 years, my life was teaching children. Right. And now it's the same thing. My my purpose has not changed. It's just my assignment now looks different is now I'm teaching black educators to get free. So um, I appreciate you for just like all the ways, even through this process of like launching the business school, you've been able to lean in support and give me gems along the way and just appreciate you inviting me to, to have this conversation to share with your audience. Um, and just grateful for you. Super grateful yeah. for you. Of course. Absolutely. So, like I said, definitely just appreciate you coming on. I know you're very busy. Um, so, any last words for the people before we wrap? Oh, last words are just uh, someone, I was listening to a devotional yesterday, uh, and the thing that I'm still sitting with is, is from a mindset standpoint, the pastor was Darius Daniels, and he said, you know, the issue is that you think you and me are different, right? And like, so that's the piece that I, I leave you with is like, that's a mindset, you know, opportunity. If you think me and you are different, because the truth is, is we're not, mm. <laughs> like, we're not different. <laughs> like I just made a decision to go and I've made a decision to keep going. Right, right, I've just right, made right. a decision to be consistent. I've just made a decision to show up in spite of fear and to move fear into the passenger seat and keep driving the car. I'm not saying fear ain't there. Fear is in the passenger seat, right? right and it's right, trying right, to control right, right. the radio and I'm like, go to sleep, right? And so I just say that to say is that like, 
whatever your greatest heart's desires are, it is truly possible. You just have to give yourself the permission to say yes. And it's my greatest hope for you that you say yes, you continue to say yes, and you surround yourself with a community that even when you feel that temptation to like say no, like you're reminded of what's on the other side of the yes. So mm. those are my final words. Mm, I love that. And I hope y'all caught all that fire that she just dropped in a very short amount of time. So again, Dr. Erica, thank you so much for coming on. Like I said, I know you're busy. You know you have a lot going on, but you dropped a lot of gems, even for myself. I always learn so much just talking to you and having conversations. So again, I just thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. And I appreciate you. And um, uh, send me that picture from the corporate days. I need to see that. <laughs> let me, I need let me, proof. Let me find that. I'm going to send it. You'll be like, you the same person? <laughs> thank you. I appreciate you. All right. All right. I'll talk to you later.